Hello, cat. Alright. <laughs> oh, my try hack me is like ridiculously slow and it's showing me all this crap. Running networks have. To answer questions, this network map updates to show you what you've compromised or discovered. Cool story. Running networks have an expiry time where machines shut down, extend the network time to keep it running. Networks are shared with other users. You can vote once an hour to reset this network to its initial state. How long you have left in this room? Nine days of access. So yeah, I d I've unlocked this because I've got the streak. Obviously, you need seven days. So yeah, this will be my first sub trial room. So we're gonna have a play through this. Um, learn how to pivot through the network by compromising a public facing web machine and tunneling your traffic to access other machines in Wreath's network. Strike the streak limitations only for non subs. So, yeah, um, yeah, the idea is to breach one machine and learn to pivot across the network into other machines. So, this is like the first time we've had to do any pivoting and a multi box um, walkthrough as well. So, interesting. Um, we need to create our room. So CD um, So make a dear wreath. Two, two Firefoxes that send that. Cool. Can you see that all right? Looks like it. So we've got one minute thirty, so let's download task files. Wreath is designed as a learning resource for beginners with a primary focus on pivoting, working with an Empire C2, and a simple antivirus evasion techniques. Following topics will also be covered, albeit more briefly, code analysis, Python and PHP, locating and modifying public exploits, simple web app enumeration and exploitation, Git repository analysis, simple Windows post exploitation techniques, CLI firewall administration, cross compilation techniques, coding wrapper programs, simple, exp F simple exfiltration techniques, and formatting a pen test report. These will be taught in the course of exploiting the Reef network. Uh, let's go full screen. Oh, let go. So, uh, this is designed as almost a sandbox environment to follow along with the teaching content the focus will be on the above teaching points rather than on initial access and privilege escalation contrary to other boxes on the platform where the, fo the focus is on the challenge a zip file containing the tools demonstrated throughout the room is attached to the task that said while these will work it's advisable to download the latest versions of these tools as instructed by the tasks during your progression through the content rather than lying on the provided archive. Okay, cool. So, password for the zip file is wreath network. So we've got netcat, socat, invoke port scan, nmap, Chisel, Mimic Apps, and Win Peas. Okay, I've got at least half of those. Cool. Um, Darkstar has kindly created a, a series of videos to accompany his teaching content in the Reef Network. Please use these as your first line of support. Write ups in the form of pen test reports are also available. Videos can be accessed directly from the YouTube channel, however, each task in the room also contains a link to the video. CG Look for the plate. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, da, 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 where was I? We lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, look for the play button at the bottom right of the screen. This will update on a task by task basis. It always points to the correct video. Oh, nice. Did it tell you your pass rate? Did you, did you absolutely smash it? Or scrape through? <laughs> Doesn't matter either way, it's still a pass. Yeah, no, well done. Uh, I had a 779. So kind of okay, what was the pass rate? I don't even know what sec plus is. Is it 750? It's usually like 75%-ish anyway, so I wouldn't, wouldn't feel bad if you scraped it or not. It, like I said, pass is a pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, don't worry about it, dude. Pass is a pass, you absolutely smashed it. Remember to go update your LinkedIn now. <laughs> EBQs. What do you mean by PBQs? What's performance-based? Performance okay. Nice. That means that something's obviously stuck in as you've been going through and learning stuff. Da, da, da. Right, what do we have here? So we've got some prereqs. So it's designed for beginners, assumes basic competence of the command line, fundamental hacking methodology, the ability to read and write a little code is also useful. <laughs> yeah, my sis, I think I took about at least six months of my sis. And yeah, like, it was. Uh, coming home from work, studying flat out for like most nights until I got it. So it isn't pleasant. There's so much content. There's not much content in each of those domains, but the sheer breadth of everything you have to know is ridiculous. So, uh, so if you can write code, it's also useful. Ooh, I'm trying to practice at the moment for one of the AWS um, what's it called this this security speciality now so that's my next one it will be my first cloud search so that's going to be interesting so, yeah. so if you can write code it's useful other than required knowledge will be linked throughout the task if you need help then try the discord there's a channel set up for the purpose uh, as this network is shared amongst a number of people, it goes without saying, please don't mess things up for users in the network. There is no password changes required in any tasks. No files need to be deleted. At various stages in this network, it's necessary to upload files and tools to the remote box. Please upload these in the format tool slash username. Good luck on that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I've, I've literally just got the exam voucher, so I'm like, I haven't, I think I've watched an hour or two's worth of the practice because um, it's all self-learning I've not got any like boot camps or anything so I've, I'm literally at the start of that journey I've never done any dev in, in AWS so this is going to be completely new to me yeah please upload. so tool slash username eg socat and whoever the user is uh, this will avoid overwriting work belonging to anyone else. In short, don't be a troll, be respectful and have fun. Cool. So we know the rules of engagement. Accessing the network. Before you get into the content, we need to know how to access it. Joining requires a seven day streak or a subscription. So we got the streak because we're cheap. Uh, to limit the number of networks which have to stay active at any one point, network access will last 10 days after joining, at which point you'll be automatically removed. However, rejoining does not require a streak, so if you didn't manage to finish 10 days, you can rejoin immediately and keep it up. Okay, that's cool. I didn't know that. I'd assumed you'd need the streak to, um, to get on here. 
Cool. So yeah, progress doesn't reset. Whether you're using the attack box or a local machine to connect to the Trihackney network, you'll need to use the OpenVPN. Uh, if you're using the local machine, then you need to download the configuration pack from the access page. If you're a subscriber, you can use the attack box. Cool. If you be aware, this is still a VPN. So you will need to use IP to see your available addresses. Pick one that starts with 1050 and use that for all reverse connections in the network. If you're you are encouraged to use your own VM when attacking Reef. The content in this room will be difficult to colour in the time available on a single attack box and the persistence of a local VM will be hugely advantageous. Equally, certain sections such as the Empire section will be very difficult to perform with the attack box. If you don't have a local Kali VM, pre-built versions can be found on VMware and VirtualBox. Well, we've done that, so we don't need to worry about that. Uh, no. On the access page, click on Networks tab and select Reef from the drop-down. Okay, so they, you do have to do something different. You need a separate OpenVPN configuration, I see. This will only appear if you've joined the room. If you're viewing the room just now, click the Join button at the top of the page. Okay, so we need our config. Da -da -da. Where the fuck do I get that? Click on Network tab and select Reef. Eh? Yeah, where does it say that? No, I don't want a tag box. Stop. Access. Networks, there we go. So network, brief, download configuration. Save. Yeah, where did I put the last one? There. So it's got M set reef, okay. So I need to go to my VPN desktop. And this time we're doing the reef network. Cool, so now we've got a 1050 address. Cool, so we've done that. Uh, click on the green, yeah, okay, we've done that. Uh, da, 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 da. Placing the name of the config, yes, we've done that. Without closing the connection, open a terminal. In most cases, the easiest way to technically run the ocean VPN. Da, da, da. Yeah, okay, we've done that. Controlling the network, it has three states running, stopped, and resetting. The current state will be shown in the top right of the no network box. Running means that the network is fully operational and can be connected to. Stopped indicates the network has gone to sleep. This happens once. When no one has pressed the extend button within the time limit to prevent the network from being constantly running, um, it can be restarted by pressing the start button. It does not reset the network back to a clean copy, so any of the stored targets should still be there. Resetting indicates the network is currently in the process of being wiped and resetting it back to its default state. This can be used when something or someone has happened to one of the targets, rendering it broken. Three buttons below it. The network map can be used to control the functionality. Start, restarts, extends, extends it, stops again to sleep. Reset initiates full wipe. It requires the percentage of users in the network to click the button. Uh, finally, the network uptime field at the bottom of the right of the map indicates how long the network has been awake. Cool. Alright, task three. What the fuck is this? <laughs> Out of the blue, an old friend from university, Thomas Reith, 
calls you after several years of no contact, you spend a few minutes catching up before he reveals the reason he called. I heard you got into hacking, that's awesome. I have a few servers set up on my home network for projects, I was wondering if it might like to assess them. Take a moment to think about it before deciding to accept the job, it's for a friend after all. Turning down his offer of payment, you tell him, I'll do it. <laughs> Thomas has sent over the following information about the network. There are two machines on my home network that host projects oh, host that host projects and stuff. I'm working in my own time. One of them has a web server and a port forwarded. That's your way in if you can find a vulnerability. It's serving a website that pushed to my Git server from my own PC for version control. It's then cloned to a public facing server. See if you can get onto these. My own PC is also on that network. I doubt you'll be able to get into that as it has protections turned on. Uh, it doesn't run anything vulnerable and it can be it can't be accessed by the public facing section of the network Well, I say PC. It's technically a repurposed server because I had a spare license lying around, but same difference From this we can take away the following pieces of information. There are three machines in the network There is one public facing or at least one and there is a self-hosted git server somewhere on the network The git server is internal so Thomas may have pushed sen sensitive information and there is a PC on the network that has antivirus installed, meaning we can guess a hazard is most likely to be Windows. By the sound of it, it's likely to be the server variant of Windows, which might work in our favor. And the assumed Windows PC cannot be accessed directly from the web server. Uh, this is enough to get started. Note, you also encouraged to treat this network like a penetration test. Take notes and screenshots of every step and write a full report at the end, especially if you're not already familiar with writing such a report. Keep track of any files, tools or payloads and users uh, you'd like to create. Oh, and users you create would also be a good idea. Reports will not be marked, but the act of writing them is a good practice for any professional work or certifications you may do in the future. There will be more information on the actual report writing in the debrief and report task, but for now just focus on extensive notes and screenshots. If you're not already comfortable taking notes, take a look into Cherry Tree or Notion as hierarchical, hierarchical note-taking applications and focus on documenting every step of the process. This room is written in a way that encourages easy note-taking, so note down your kill chain as you go along and take lots of screenshots. Reports can be submitted to the room as write-ups in the format specified in the questions uh, of the debrief report task. The first five high-quality write-ups submitted to the room are featured here. Cool. Are these web notation things or what are they? Dun, dun, dun. So you can just run that. Cool. I think I'll just run with uh, Sublime until I decide that that's a shit idea. <laughs> so yeah, let's just go save as documents. No. Yeah, documents, THM, Reef. Before we start the task, if you're using Kali, make sure that it's up to date. Just guess I could run this quick. Stop any bastards hacking me back. <laughs> uh, this is not necessary on the attack box. Good. While that's running, let's read the next bit. So as with any attack, we first begin with the enumeration phase. Completing the nmap room, if you haven't already, will help this section. Thomas gave us an IP to work with, as shown on the network panel. Let's start by performing a port scan of the first 15,000 ports of this IP. Here and in general, it's a good idea to save your scan results to a file so you don't have to rerun the scan twice. 
Broken packages. So what? <laughs> Depends on this, but we're going to install that. Uh, no, we're going to install that, but that's instant. We'll just fucking update it. Well, whatever. Let's, let's YOLO it for now. All right. So what? How many of the first 15,000 15, ports are open on the target? So we're going to do Rust scan. My IP or uh, actually let's let's do it properly. Let's sudo nano hosts. Let's just create a file for it. Ten dot two hundred dot one hundred one dot two hundred and we'll call it uh Reese. Uh, should we just call it Reef1 or Reef www because it's a web service? Reef Web. Oh, so now we can just do Rust Scan Reef Web. What? Oh, I've got to reset the network, haven't I? Um, so well then let's do that. Uh, log in. Should now work. What do you mean you can't resolve it? doesn't resolve if it pings it, alright? Zero day was here. <laughs> right, so it's done four beneath 1500, so let's Hope that's the right answer, which it is good. Uh, what OS does Nmap think is running? We've got to wait for Nmap to run. the joy of running and uh, of running rust scan instead of nmap like you get the results straight away while it does the vulnerability scan <laughs> all right so let's save our notes or i could just fucking cancel the script because i'm a twat
Uh, can we give this a different syntax? That's the bash. So what have we got? We've got it's discovered the open ports, it's got CentOS. You can read data files from user bin share and that, okay. And um, and Matt, there we go. So thinks that uh, sent ls is running. Yeah, there we go. Uh, open the IP in the browser. What site does the server try to redirect you to? Wreath web. Take two of this doesn't work either. There we go. Accept the risk. me to do the IP then let's do Notice that site fails to resolve. Looks like Thomas forgot to set up the DNS. Uh, so we actually, <laughs> because I did the host thing already, it like already worked. That's quite funny. So you have to add it to your host file manually. This can be accomplished by editing that. So. You So I have to use his actual his actual IP. So that's okay. so it should be Thomas Reith dot THM. Set this risk. And we get in. Reload the page, it will now resolve. It will give you another issue related to TLS. This occurs because the box didn't is not really connected to the internet and cannot give you know, doesn't have a signed TLS cert. Uh, so we accept the risk. Uh, you should never do this in the real world. In real life, you perform a footprinting phase of the engagement at this point. It essentially involves finding as much public information about the target as possible and noting it down. You never know, it could prove useful. Read through the text on the page. What is Thomas's mobile phone number? So we've got his education. Phone number. Oh, it's mobile, there we go. 
guessing we want the plus as well. Let's have a look at the highest open port. Look back at your service scan. What does the service version does Nmap detect is running here? Thomas Reese.thm Doesn't look like it's going to be that. It didn't give us. Oh, it didn't do the higher ones either the last time. We got all of these last time. Oh, let's see what this other map comes back with. Oh, that's cool. It gives you the uh, tux penguin on there. This is like Armitage if you ever use that. Or Cobalt Strike, the paid one. Do the Thomas Wreath now. What's the what's the sodding ports thing on this? I can't remember. It's range, that's what you want. These could be resolved. You know this IP at the top of my bloody head scene. One hundred and one, two hundred.
No, you're not getting away with three. You're scanning. There's four ports. That's, that was the answer earlier. There we go. Car's <laughs> just slow as hell, what's going on? There we go, web min. Attach these to my results. Right, uh, put your answer to the last question into Google. It appears that this service is vulnerable to an unauthenticated remote code exploitation. What is the CV number for the exploit? So Just straight up Google it. Oh, stop. Let's do the Xbox TV one thing. I want some random website. Got the CV number as well as the exploit code. So let's uh, we have everything we need to break into this machine. So let's get going. In the previous task, we found a vulnerable service running on the target, which will give us our ability to run remote code. Next step would be to find an exploit for the vulnerability. There are often exploits available online for known vulnerabilities, and we'll cover searching for these in an upcoming task. However, in this instance, an exploit is provided here. Start by cloning the repository. This can be done with the following command. Right, let's go back into Reese. Git clone. Let's copy that. I can't be asked to type it in. So we've cloned it. Uh, CD CV and and pip. Install. Oh, we don't have pip three. Pip. 
I can't believe I didn't have Pip installed, that's pretty stupid. Alright, Pip 3. Install our requirements. We've successfully installed our pass. So it should already be executable, if not add the executable bit. Um, let's just try it. So CV target IP 10.200.181.200. Two hundred. Told you I remember it. Pseudo shell has been obtained. So here we go. Root. Nice. So we've obtained pseudo root. Done that. Which user is the server running as it's running as root? We don't need to elevate privileges here because we're already the top dog. Uh, before we do, let's. Uh, this is a nice pseudo shell, it's not a reverse shell. Let's get a reverse shell from the target. You can do this manually or by typing shell into the pseudo shell and following the instructions given. Let's do it the way that it intends, so shell. Starting the reverse shell process for Unix targets only. Use exit to return the pseudo shell at any time. Enter an IP for the shell. Let's go. Let's get my IP. Enter the port number 4444. Cool, so we got our shell. Optional stabilize the reverse shell. Uh, let's do that. I've got. Where's my thing? So background it. Echo. Seven seven STTY raw echo Piece of shit. Stairs, the trash man says. 
Eh, sí, sí. You have the title of last female category as satisfactory. BW or Ludwig Stevens? Oh, yes, I do. Nice one. <laughs> I am retarded. Alright, THM. Wreath. Hello, motherfucker! Hello, motherfucker! Sound alerts. Safe. How are you doing, Stairs? Stairs, the trash man played her little mother at the uh, Science and technology. There we go. Might actually get some people to turn up now. <laughs> Stairs, the trash man says. Dingo, yes, she did. What was I doing? Netcat. Oh, did you? That should have gone out ages ago. I want to do, uh, like, let's see. Does it send you this? Did you get another one? I just set the go live notification to MSEC, I sent you a private message. <laughs> so hopefully it will socially engineer people. Right. <laughs> right, so we're listening. We've got to redo this sodding thing. Hacks. Copy. Put my IP in. Four 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 four. Start an account listener. Got the shell. Oh no. no. Copy, paste. Background the shell. STTY raw echo. Terminal type. This is better. So we want X term two five six color. And then we want export term equals x term export shell equals bash stty roads 61 stty columns 116 cool so now we should have Backspace, and we can do uh, da, 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 ls cd. Okay, cool. Right, so we've got a stable shell. And I need to update my notes so that this is like that. So we have a stable shell. Now for post exploitation, what is the root user's password hash? So if we go uh, cat etc shadow, we can get that hash. Let's just dump the whole thing, because why not? Shadow. Then we can copy the hash. Do like that. Let's 
of the whole thing. Yeah, cool. Uh, you won't be able to crack the root password hash, but you might be able to find a certain file that will give you consistent access to the root user account through one other service on the box. What is the full path to this file? Might be able to find a certain file that will give you consistent access to root through another, through one of the other services. Let's take a look at the hint. Where are SSH keys still? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So if we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, where the fuck is this usually? Is it home or at root? Dot SSH dot. There we go, and then we get RSA ID. So root SSH ID RSA. There we go, and let's copy that. So if we steal that key, uh, IDR saying. Cool, so now we can use this RSA key to log in as root whenever we want. So. Uh, download a copy of the string, copy and pasting it to your own attack machine, then use the command chun change mod 600 keyname to have personal access. That's what we're doing. Right, uh, let's do that while I remember. So. Um, new file, paste, save as in reef. Oh, and then change my odd 600 RSA. Oh, wait, I'm not in the root. Uh, Wreath, change my RSA. There we go. Cool. So now we've got a saved file that we can use. Pivoting. What is pivoting? Pivoting is the art of using access obtained over one machine to exploit another machine deeper in the network. It's one of the most essential aspects of network penetration testing is one of the three main teaching points of the room. Simply by using one technique described in the following tasks or others, it becomes possible to, for the attacker to gain initial access to a remote network and use it to gain access to other machines in the network that we'd not normally be at the other that would not otherwise be accessible. In this diagram there are four machines on the target network. One is public facing, not that one, <laughs> uh, with three machines which are not exposed to the internet. By accessing the public server we can then pivot to and attack the remaining three targets. This is an example diagram is not representative of the wreath network. Uh, this section will contain a lot of theory for pivoting from both Linux and Windows compromised targets we will then put into practice against the next machine in the network. Remember though, you have a sandbox environment available to you with the compromised machine in the Reef network. After the enumeration tasks coming up, you'll also know about the next machine in the network. Feel free to use these boxes to play around with, with the tools as you go through the task, but be aware that some techniques may be stopped by the firewalls involved. Which we'll look at mitigating in the next later in the network. Cool. High level overview. The methods that we use to pivot tend to vary between the different target operating systems. Frameworks like Metasploit can make the process easier, however, for the time being, we'll be looking at the more manual techniques of pivoting. Uh, there are two main methods encompassed in this area of pen testing. 
tunneling or proxying, creating a proxy type connection through the compromised machine in order to route all traffic to the desired network. This could potentially be tunneled inside another protocol, SSH tunneling for example, uh, which could be useful for evading basic intrusion detection systems or a firewall. Uh, creating a connection between a local port and a single port on a target via a compromised host. A proxy is good if we want to redirect lots of kinds of traffic onto our network, for example with an Nmap scan or with access to multiple ports on multiple different machines. Port forwarding tends to be faster and more reliable but only allows us to access a single port or a, single ra or a small range on a target device. Which style of pivoting is more suitable will depend entirely on the layout of the network, so we have to start out with further enumeration before we decide to proceed. It would be sensible at this point to also start to draw out a layout of the, di the network diagram as you see it, although in the case of this practice net network the layout is given in the box at the top of the screen. As a general rule, if you have multiple possible entry points, try to use a Linux Unix target where possible as these tend to be easier to pivot from. An outward facing Linux web server is ideal. The remaining tasks in this section will cover the following topics. Enumerating a network using native and st statically compiled tools, uh, proxy chains, foxy proxy, SSH port forwarding, plink, socat, chisel and SSH at all. Uh, this is far from an exhaustive list, but the tools available for pivoting, so further research is encouraged. You're... Which type of pivoting creates a channel through which information can be sent inside of another protocol? Tunneling. Not covered in this network, but good to know about which Metasploit Framework Meterpreter command can be used to create a port forward. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's probably forward or something stupid. Let me be forward. No, or else the hint. Google this, you dumbass. Yeah. Port forward. I knew it was going to be something like that. All right. P forward. All right. Port forward command from within Meterpreter is the most commonly used pivoting technique. Just set up a, a host to listen to local port, remote port, remote host. Fair enough. All right, enumeration. As always, enumeration is the key to success. Information is power. The more that we know about our target, the more options we have available to us. As such, our first step when attempting to pivot through the network is to get an idea of what's around us. There are five possible ways to enumerate a network through a compromised host. Using the material found on the machine, host file, arp cache, for example. Using pre-installed tools, using statically compiled tools, using scripting techniques, using local tools through a proxy. These are written in order of preference. Using local tools for a proxy is incredibly slow, so should only be used as a last resort. Ideally, we want to take advantage of the pre-installed tools on the system. Uh, Linux systems sometimes have Nmap installed by default. This is an example of living off the land, a good way of, to minimize your risk. Failing that, it's very easy to transfer a static binary or put together a simple swing, uh, ping sweep in Bash, which we'll cover below. Before anything else though, it's sensible to check if there are any pieces of useful information stored on the target. ARP-A can be used to Windows or Linux to check for an ARP cache on the machine. This will show you any IP addresses of hosts that the target has interacted with recently. Equally static mappings can be found in ETC hosts uh, or the, the host file on Windows. ETC resolve conf on Linux may also identify any local DNS servers which may be misconfigured to allow something like a DNS zone transfer attack, uh, which is out of the scope of the content. 
um, but it's worth looking into. On Windows, the easiest way to check for DNS servers is for an interface with ipconfig slash all. Linux has an equivalent command uh, as an alternative to reading resconf nmcli dev show. So let's do up a what we can. Oh, uh, which we need to do on the other one. So let's do it here. Up a. So we want them on etc hosts, so cat etc hosts with a forward slash idiot. <laughs> local host, local host, local host. Yeah, okay. Let's save it anyway, just so I know I've done it. Ba 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 ba. ETC resolve as well. Oh, cool. so we got that. There are no useful tools already installed on the system. The rudimentary scripts are not working. It's possible to get static copies of many tools. There are versions of the tool that have been compiled in such a way that don't require any dependencies on the box. In other words, they could theoretically work on any target, assuming the correct OS and architecture. For example, statically compiled copies of Nmap for a different operating system, along with other tools, can be found in various places on the internet. If a good, if dated, resource of these can be found here, more up to date at the time of writing. Can be found here. Be aware that many repositories of static tools are very outdated. Tools from these repositories will still uh, will likely still do the job. However, you may find they require a different syntax or don't work in quite the way that you've come to expect. The difference between a static binary and a dynamic binary is in compilation. The most programs use a variety of external bi libraries on Linux. Um, .so files on Linux. .dll files on Windows. These are referred to as dynamic programs. Static programs are compiled with these libraries built into the finished executable files. Uh, when we're trying to use the binary on the target system, we nearly always need the statically compiled copy of the program, as the system may not have the dependencies installed. Finally, the dreaded scanning through a proxy we should use as an absolute last resort. Scanning through something like proxy chains is very slow often limited, you can't run a UDP's port through a TCP proxy, for example. One exception to this rule is using the Nmap scripting engine, as the script library does not come with the statically compiled version of the tool. As such, you can use a static copy of Nmap to sweep the network and find hosts with open ports, but then use your local copy of Nmap through the proxy specifically against the found ports. Before putting all of this into practice, let's talk about living off the land shell techniques. Ideally a tool like Nmap will already be installed, however this is not always the case. You'll, need, you'll find that Nmap is not installed on the currently compromised server of Wreath. If this happens, it's worth looking into whether you can use an installed shell to perform a sweep of the network. For example, the following bash one-liner will perform a full ping sweep of the 192.168.1 network. This could be easily modified to search for other network ranges, including the Wreath network. The above command generates a full list of numbers 1 to 5, 1, 2, 255, 
and loops through it. For each number it sends one ICPMP packet to 192.168.1x as a backgrounded job, meaning that each ping runs in parallel for speed, where i is the current number, each response is, return is searched for bytes from to see if the ping was successful. Only successful responses are shown. The equivalent of this command in PowerShell is unbearably slow, so it's better to find an alternate option where possible. It's relatively straightforward to write a simple network scanner in a language like C Sharp, or a statically compiled scanner written in C, C++, uh, which can be compiled and used on the target. This, however, is out of the scope of the Reef network. Uh, da -da -da, very simple beta examples can be found here. It's worth noting as well that you may encounter hosts which have firewalls blocking ICMPMP pings. Windows boxes frequently do this, for example. It's likely to be less of a problem when pivoting. However, these firewalls, by default, often only apply to external traffic, meaning anything sent through the compromised host on the network should be safe. Worth keeping in mind, however, if you suspect a host is active but is blocking ping requests, you should also check for some common ports using a tool like Netcat. Port scanning in Bash can be done ideally or entirely natively. Uh, bear in mind this will take a very long time. Uh, there can be other ways to perform enumeration using only the tools available on the system. Please experiment further and see what you can come up with. What is the absolute path to the file containing DNS entries? Uh, etc resolve .com. What is the absolute path to the host file on Windows? Oh, for God's sake. How could you see which IP addresses are active and allow ICPMP echo requests onto the 172.160.24 network using Bash? Which is the one that does. Um, So we want one seven two sixteen zero. There we go. Right, proxy chains. In this task, we'll be looking at two proxy tools, Proxy Chains and Foxy Proxy. Both allow us to connect through one of the proxies we'll learn about in the upcoming task. When creating a proxy, we'll open up a port on our own attacking machine, which is linked to the compromised server, giving us access to the target network. Think of this as being something like a tunnel created between a port on our attacking box that comes out inside the target network, like a secret tunnel from a fantasy story hidden beneath the floorboards of the local bar and exiting in the, the palace treasure chamber. Proxy chains and foxy proxy can be used to direct our traffic through this port and into our target network. Proxy chains is a tool that we've already briefly mentioned in previous tasks. It's a very useful tool, although not without its drawbacks. Proxy chains can often slow down a connection. Performing an end map through it is especially hellish. Ideally, you should try to use static tools where possible and route traffic through proxy chains only when required. That said, let's take a look at the tool itself. Proxy Chains is a command line tool which is activated by propending the command proxy chains to other commands. For example, to proxy netcat through a proxy, you could use the command proxy chains netcat and then the IP and, and the port. Notice that the proxy port was not specified in the above command because proxy chains reads its option from the config file. The master config file is located at etc proxy chains conf, which is where proxy chains will look by default. However, it's actually the last location where proxy chains will look. The location in order is the current directory proxy chains, uh, dot proxy chains, and then etc proxy chains. 
This makes it extremely easy to configure proxy chains for a specific assignment without altering a master file. Simply execute cpcc proxy chains and then make any changes in a local, like in a current directory. If you're likely to move directories a lot, then you could instead place it in a dot proxy chains directory under your home directory, achieving the same result. If you happen to lose or destroy the original master copy of proxy chains, a replacement can be downloaded here. Speaking of proxy chains file, there is only one section in particular used to us at this moment. Right at the bottom of the file, there are the servers used by the proxy. You can set more than one server here to chain proxies. However, for the time being, we'll stick to one. Right, well, let's get a copy of our proxy chain. So, CP etc proxy chains 4 I guess So we go to socks for we've got it set up the same, so that should be fine. It's here that we can choose which ports to forward the connection through by default. There is one proxy set to localhost 950. This is the default port for a tour entry point. Should you choose to run one of your attacking machine, that said, it's not hugely useful to us. This should be changed to whichever arbitrary port is being used for the proxy we'll be setting up in the following task. There is one other line in the proxy chain configuration that's worth paying attention to, specifically related to proxy DNS. Where was that? Let's go, man! <laughs> How are you doing, Born Unique? Let's go, man! Proxy DNS, there we go. Proxy DNS daemon. So we've already got it enabled. If you're performing a proxy chain through it, if you're performing an MMAP scan through proxy chain, this option can cause the scan to hang. That's good to hear. Okay, so if we want to stop the DNS that we have to comment it at the start of the line before performing the scan. The other things to note when scanning through proxy chains, you can only use TCP scan, no UDP or SYN, no pings will also not work, so use the PN switch to prevent Nmap trying it. Uh, it will be extremely slow, try to use Nmap through the proxy when using the, the oh, what's it called, the script engine see where the host ports are before proxying to the local copy of MMAP. So proxy chain is an acceptable option when using CLI tools but if you're working with a web browser it's better to access the web app through a proxy. Uh, there is a better option available namely Foxy Proxy. People frequently use this tool to manage Burp Suite or Zap Proxy yeah, okay, whatever. I've got to install the extension if I do this. Uh, what line would you put into your proxy config file to redirect for a SOX4 Sox, Sox proxy? You put SOX4. Uh, what command would you use to telnet through a proxy to that? Oh, was it prox? Proxy chain. Telnet. 172.16.0.100.23. You have discovered a web app running on the target inside an isolated network. Which tool is more apt for proxying to a web app? Proxy chains or Foxy Proxy? Well, Foxy Proxy. 
We're actually going to do the tunnel yet. <laughs> so. Yeah, cool. Right, I am going to get a drink quick. Um, but if you give me five minutes and I'll be back. So hang tight. <laughs> Another muscle out. Ah. <laughs> Reach the limit. <laughs> there we go. Winner. That's better. Kaboom! <laughs> See something quick before I go back to the hacks. There's my. Just checking. Okay. Let's just go. I will be waiting for your Active Directory network streams from your side man. <laughs> we uh, did do some Kerberos stuff a little while ago. There we go, there's a watch part. Let's do. Where's the normal camera? Oh, why am I frozen? I'm not even wearing that t-shirt. How's it got that snapshot? Activate. No, weird. Nobody broadcast doesn't want to turn off. I just shut it down to, to sort off. Hey, there we go. Booty cat. <laughs> I know you want to sleep, but I want to see a cat. <laughs> Alright, let's see if I can get my camera scope I found. Success! Right, uh, back to the hex. Uh, where's my music? Oh, it's absolutely boiling in here, but like. Let's first get. That's uh, 
Back thing. Pocket button. What the fuck is that? And uh, add ons. Proxy proxy standard. Alright, cool. So now we've got Foxy Proxy just in case we need it. Uh, the first tool we'll be looking at is none other than the bog standard SSH client that we use with the OpenSSH server. Using these simple tools, it's possible to create both a forward and a reverse connection to make an SSH tunnel, allowing us to forward ports and create proxies. Creating a forward or a local SSH tunnel can be done from our attacking box when we have SSH access to the target, which we do. If I get rid of this. Let's rename this. This is our brief uh, web shell. Um, guess we don't need that open anymore. Let's just call this uh, CB two hundred nineteen one five one zero seven. Right, so a little tidy up. Um, creating a port forward or a local SSH tunnel could be done from our attack box. When we have SSH access to the target as such, the technique is much more commonly used against Unix hosts. Linux servers in particular commonly have SSH active and open. That said, Microsoft re relatively recently brought out their own implementation of OpenSSH, uh, so this technique may begin to be more popular in this regard if, we fe if, it if the feature gains more traction. There are two ways to create a forward SSH tunnel using SSH client port forwarding and creating a proxy. Port forwarding is accomplished with the L switch, which creates a link to a local port. For example, if we had SSH access to that IP and there's a web server running on 16.0.10, we could use this to create a link to the server on 16.0.10. So you do SSH L, because that's 8,000 to 80. We could then access the website on 16.10 through 16.5 by navigating to port 8000 on our own attack machine. For example, by entering localhost 8000 into a web browser using the technique we have effectively created a tunnel between port 80 on the target and port 8000 on our own box. Note that it's good practice to use a high port out of the way for the local connection. This means that low ports are still open for their correct use. If we want to start our own web server to serve an exploit to the target and also means we do not need to use sudo to create the connection. The fn combine switch does two things. f backgrounds the shell immediately so we have our own terminal back and the n tells SSH that we don't need to execute any commands, only set up the connection. Save that in my notes.
Alright, uh, proxies are made using the D switch, for example D1337 will open a port 1337 on the attack box as a proxy to send data through to the protected network. This is useful when combined with a tool such as proxy chains. An example of this command would be sshd leap user, uh, user 172.16.05.fn Again, fn backgrounds the shell. Uh, the choice of 133 is completely arbitrary, all that matters the port is available and set up. Uh, reverse connections are very possible with SSH. Indeed, may be preferable if you have a shell on the compromised server but not SSH access. They are, however, riskier if you inherently must access your attack machine from the target, be it using credentials or preferably a key-based system. Before we can make a reverse connection safely, there are a few steps we need to take. Generate a new set of SSH keys and store them somewhere safe, SSH keygen. An LSL reverse. So I guess we should be doing this, let's go. Doing, this is just telling me how to do it. So before we can make a reverse connection safely, we need to create some keys. This gets you a private and public key. Then you copy the public key ending in pub to the authorized keys file on your own attack box. You may need to create the SSH directory and authorized key file first. On a new line, type the following line and paste a couple of key. Command echo, this account can only be used for port forwarding, no agent forwarding. This makes sure that the key can only be used for port forwarding, allowing the ability to gain a shell on your attack machine. Okay, let's copy those to our notes as well. Let's go, okay, should be in this one. goes in here. My laptop's running so much more cooler now that I had to take the battery out. The <laughs> the battery was like swelling up and the like the trackpad section you couldn't click it because it was just being lifted up so much by the battery. I still got it. It's like right here. I don't know if you can make it out but Got a nice little bulge in it. I'm trying to keep it in a cool place before it like explodes everything. Right. So we copy the entry to authorize key, it looks something like this. Check if the SSH server on your attack machine is running. If the service is running, then you should get a response that looks like this with active shown in the message. Let's copy that as well. The status command indicates the server is not running, you can start it. The only thing left to do is the unthinkable, transfer the private key to the target box. This is usually an absolute no-no, which is why we generated a throwaway SSH key to be discarded as soon as the engagement is over. With the key transferred, we can then connect back with a reverse port forward using the following command. Let's 
To put that into context, our fictitious IPs, if we have a shell on 5 and want to give our attack box 20 access to the web server on 10, we could use this command. This would open up a port forward to our Kali box, allowing us access to 10 in exactly the same way as with a port forward connection we made before. In newer versions of the SSH client, it's also possible to create a reverse proxy, the equivalent of the D switch used in the local connection. This may not work with older clients, but this command can be used to create a reverse proxy in clients which do support it. Just save that as well. Da -da -da -da. Modern Windows comes with a built in SSH client available by default. This allows us to make use of this technique in Windows systems even if there is no SSH server running. Uh, as we're connecting back from, in many ways, this makes the next task covering Plink redundant. However, it's still very relevant for older systems. Uh, to close any of these connections, type ps orgs grep ssh. So that gets you the processes and then sudo kill pid. Right, so if you're connecting to an ssh server from your attacking machine to create a port forward, this would be a local port or a remote port. Local. Which switch combination can be used to background an SSH port uh, FN? It's a good idea to enter our own password on the remote machine to set up a reverse proxy. <laughs> Nay. <laughs> what command should you use to create a pair of throwaway SSH keys for a reverse connection? Uh, SSH key gen. If you wanted to set up a reverse port forward from 22, a, re a remote machine to port 222 2, of your local machine 200 using a key file called IDRSA and backgrounding the shell, what command would you use? Assume your username is Kali. Fucking hell. So we want to do. Uh, SSH dash R Kali at one seven two one six dot zero dot two hundred I ID RSA and I feel like I've missed something. Yes, we want the U. The other port in there. Local port IP. So we need the two 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 one seven two dot one six dot zero one hundred. Then the Cali. Then the I. Then yeah. Hey, first try. What command would you use to set up a forward proxy on port 8000 to use the target THM and backgrounding the shell? SSH R. Uh, yeah, 8000 user at target THM. Yeah. If you had an SSH access to server 50 with a web server running internally on port 80, only usable to the server itself on 180, how would you forward it to port 8000 on your attack machine? So this one is... If you had a, a server with a web server running 80, 
それLike halfway through this, it's like oh, we're not even halfway through, we're like a third of the way through. Uh, Plink is a Windows command line version of the Putty SSH client. Now that Windows comes with its built in SSH client, Plink is less useful, however, it's still a very useful tool, so we'll cover it here. Generally speaking, Windows servers are unlikely to have an SSH server running, so our use of Plink tends to be a case of transporting the binary to the target and then using it to create the reverse connection. This will be done with the following command. So cmd exe echo y plink local port target target port username key file n oh they didn't do fn. Notice that the syntax is nearly identical uh, when using the open ssh client CMD EXE C echo Y at the start is for a non interactive shell. Like most reverse shells, window shells being difficult to stabilize, in order to get around the warning message that target has not connected to the host before. Okay, so it just sends the Y, got you. To use our example from before, then we have to access 172.16.05. I'd like to forward a connection to dot ten back to eight thousand on our own attack machine. We could use this command. Note that any keys generated by SSH key gen will not work properly here. You need to convert them using putty gen, which can be installed on Kali using sudo apt install putty tools. I guess we should do. Suso, sudo. Shat its pants. It's completely shat its pants. Brilliant. Um, have we timed out? That might be it. Hey, look. let's extend it just in case. Yeah, cool. Um, let's get rid of that. Um, SSH uh, root at 10200 
Two hundred. Most unreachable. Two reset requests, so I'm assuming someone's fucked something. I think it may be broke. Let's, do, let's join the reset count. Maybe just start it. Um, or something weird. That was my. Has my OpenVPN died? Is this not doing anything? Definitely on. Let's just refresh this page. Maybe my IP's changed on here. Still the same. Network state stopped. Running. Anything else? I think we might have to end it here if it's not doing anything. But yeah, I think that's a good place to stop anyway. We've we've pwned the first box and we're ready to proxy into the next one. So um Yeah, let's let's save it there and we can do plink tomorrow. We'll probably finish the rest of the pivoting as well actually then. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I've never done pivoting before, so this will be fun. Quite a bit more interesting. Uh, don't need the weapon stuff. Don't need. Uh, might need that. Yes. Let's see. Uh, let's see who we've got on then. Who can we send a raid to with our? 
two viewers. <laughs> Sean's on. Right, if we raid Sean right sec. Two viewers. It says I've got six viewers on the website. What the fuck? I've got like two on my local one. It says I've got six Twitch is on the fucking stupid. Yeah, let's uh, check out Sean. I'm not sure what he's doing, but um, yeah, be interesting to see what he's up to. We'll continue Reef tomorrow, so we'll end it there. Thanks a lot. Catch you later.